We're in the home of Tony Benn in Holland Park Avenue in London. Uh, Tony Benn served in the Second World War. He then worked briefly as a radio producer and was elected to Parliament when he was only 25. Uh, he then quickly, uh, shortly afterwards, became embroiled in a controversy to do with a peerage. He unwillingly inherited the peerage, uh, which required him to resign from the House of Commons. Uh, he f- fought for a reform of the laws concerning this and was successful and resumed membership of the House of Commons. He remained there until 2001. Uh, he was a Labour cabinet minister in the Labour governments of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, his politics moved to the left when, uh, at a time when his party moved to the right. He opposed the Gulf War in 1991 and, of course, has opposed, the, has opposed the recent war in Iraq. He left Parliament in 2001, he said, to devote more time to politics. Uh, Tony Benn, um, the project of socialism seems to have failed, at least in the sense that it has failed to win the allegiance of, su- of a su- su- sufficient portion of the electorate to make a difference in Parliament. Why do you think that has happened? Well, if we'd been meeting 90 years ago, you'd have said, now look, Mr. Ben, women have never had the vote. Men don't want them to have the vote. We're not really interested in the vote. Now, be recognised the fact it's over. Or if you talked to me 50 years ago, you'd say, now look, Mr. Ben, apartheid is very well established in South Africa. The whites own the media, they own the army, they own the police, there are no trade unions. Be realistic. Um, Mandela's just been put in prison for life at the Ravonia trial. It's over. I mean, history never ends. And the thing about socialism it isn't a railway station you're aiming at. It's a, it's a way of approaching problems. I mean, Christianity hasn't exactly succeeded, has it? When you come to think of it, love thy neighbour as thyself, turn the other cheek, all that, well, that hasn't exactly succeeded. So I think to look at history in terms of has an idea succeeded or not is to misunderstand the whole process of life, which is to understand where power lies, uh, who got it, what they do with it, uh, to whom are they accountable, and how can you replace them by others. And on that basis, I mean, the most popular thing we ever did in Britain was the most socialist thing we ever did, the National Health Service. We said, whether you're rich or poor, you're entitled to medical treatment. Now, in America, the richest country in the world, there are 45 million people without any insurance. I've got a cousin in America, just sat, um, had Parkinson's, worked in a local authority, just been sacked. His wife and children had absolutely no medical insurance. And the health service is the most social thing we ever did and the most popular thing we ever did. So I, I don't accept your analysis. Had we been talking 50 years ago and had I said to you that it's likely that over the next 50 years the Labour Party will move progressively to the right, there will be a Prime Minister who <coughs> will be... Uh, uh, of the extreme right, a uh, Labour uh, Conservative Prime Minister of the extreme right, who will transform British politics, and that uh, socialism will have retreated hugely in the 50 years, uh, you would have probably said, not at all, that's not the, the trajectory of events, it's going, to be in the, it's going to be the opposite. Well, if you talked to me 75 years ago when I was five, I'd have just been to see Ramsay MacDonald because I went to number 10 Downing Street first in 1930. My dad was in the Labour cabinet, and I met Ramsay MacDonald, and he gave me a chocolate biscuit. And if you'd said to me then, now look, Mr Ben, within a year, Ramsay MacDonald will leave the Labour Party, join with the Tories, and destroy the Labour Party, and indeed, in 1931, there were only 51 Labour MPs left. I, what would I say to that? 14 years later, it was a landslide, we had the welfare state, we ended the empire without war. I mean, So I think your view of history, that's sort of static is completely misunderstanding of what history is about. History is what you do, where you live and work in your own life. And I, do, I mean, I could say to you, look at Venezuela. I mean, here is a country that has been dominated by the United States for years. They've just had elected a president, Chavez. He's uh, redistributing the land. He's establishing free, free health and education. And, uh, and that is the most socialist government that you can see at the moment. So I just I, I reject your interpretation of how history develops. You've talked about your father, Rams- Ramsay MacDonald, but, of course, your grandfather was also uh, in politics. He was a Liberal MP, as yeah. was your father. Your father Labour, uh, later became a Labour MP. And we were saying, you were telling me before the interview that your grandfather uh, was elected on a home rule ticket in the, 19, yes. in the 1890s. Yeah, 1892 he was elected. He'd been in the London County Council. He was a founder member in 1889, and then he was elected to Parliament in 1892 as a home ruler, beat a Conservative minister... 
And I mean, when I look at him, he's to the left of Tony Blair. He argued for the public ownership of the docks, which was done by a Liberal government. He argued for the public ownership of the telephone service, which was done by a Liberal government. And my father uh, was uh, exactly the same. He was elected in 1906. He supported the Irish cause. Uh, he went over to Ireland at the time of the Black and Tans, uh, supporting the Irish cause. And so, you see, if you take the Irish story, it isn't over yet, but, my God, it's different from what it was in 1892. You yourself uh, have n- were not much, was not much involved in the Irish question, though you advocated at an early stage that the British government would, would talk to Sinn Féin. Um, and, of course, you were... Uh, opposed to internment, Bloody Sunday, and, and uh, all of that. Uh, looking back on your support for Sinn Féin at a time when the IRA campaign was active, do you think that that was perhaps a mistake and that the British government was right to hold out for a ceasefire before there would be talks with Sinn Féin? Well, if you look at the argument of the ceasefire, first of all, they said there's got to be a ceasefire. Then there's got to be a permanent ceasefire. Then there's got to be a, de- a, a, a decommissioning. Then the publication, a photograph of the decommissioning. Now they've come up with new arguments because of the murder of this uh, Sinn Féin who was a police spy who got hold up. I think you have to face the fact that uh, there are a very strong body of opinion in the Republic, uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, the North, uh, which is totally opposed to the idea that there should be equality of treatment between nationalists and, and, and republicans, uh, nationalists and unionists, and I think that's what you're up against, and you have to work away at it. I mean, I am in heart, my heart of hearts a believer in non-violence, but at the same time, if there is no other way forward, you have to ask, what do you do? Mrs. Thatcher said Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. She said it. Was he a terrorist? He was, I, I spoke in Trafalgar Square in 1964 at the time of the Ravonia trial when he'd just been put in prison for life, and I was denounced as a supporter of terrorism. Next time I met him, he had a Nobel Peace Prize and was president of South Africa. What do you make of it? You see? You have to, I think you have to understand how history evolves. And, of course, I'm against violence. But then if you take the present situation, terrorism, I don't see any moral difference whatever between a stealth bomber and a suicide bomber. Both kill innocent people for political purposes. And I'm a believer in non-violence. I met Mr. Gandhi in 1931, and uh, I've always been in my heart a Gandhian. But injustice has to be remedied. We'll take a break. Arising from the, that brief discussion on Irish affairs, um, you are, or have been yourself a Republican as well as, as well as a Socialist. Yes, I think you should elect your head of state. I mean, you do. Most civilised countries do. It's not uh, an objection to the Queen. I mean, she didn't pick the job. She was born with the right parents in the right bed at the right time. So I have nothing against the royal family. But the powers of the Crown in our Constitution are enormous. Because of Crown powers, the Prime Minister can go to war without consulting Parliament. Appoints commissioners in Brussels, like Madison, without consulting Parliament. Appoint ministers, appoint commissions, appoint the Archbishop of Canterbury, because the Church of England is a nationalised industry. And so the powers of the, the patronage of a prime minister, look at all these peerages that they say are being sold, that's the powers of the crown. So I think it would be better if the powers of the crown were transferred to the House of Commons, and I introduced a bill to that effect, and blow me down, David Cameron has said he supports it. So I sent him the bill and said, thought you might be interested to see how it could be done. Uh, but it isn't hostile, hostility to the Queen. If the Queen lived in Buckingham Palace, funded by the Tourist and Holiday Board, be fine. But don't give supreme authority to someone you didn't elect. The institution, institution of the monarchy, however, still commands enormous support and allegiance here. Well, I'm in part of our culture, you can understand all that. And the Queen's done a very boring job for 50-odd years and done it very well. And uh, so that's why it's a great mistake to make it about the Queen. It's about the institutions. You see, this recent business where it is alleged that the Prime Minister is in effect, selling peerages. That is only because of the Crown. If it didn't have the Crown, it wouldn't happen. So, when you say the public has supported it, they support it except when they see its successes. They were angry that the war was done without parliamentary support. And that was because of the Crown. One of the uh, uh, great revolutions in British politics, revolution perhaps too strong a word, but uh, transformations in British politics over the last 50 years has been the tax right one. Uh, rather than a socialist one. Why do you think that was so successful? 
Well, I think what has happened in the world, if you look at it, is that in the world we live in now, we are governed by completely undemocratic forces. All the privatization, for example, that's going on is because the World Trade Organization says you have to have a level playing field. I was talking to Kenneth Kaunda, former president in Africa, an old friend of mine. He said, when we had a debt, the IMF came to us and said, we'll lift the debt if you'll sell all your schools and all your hospitals to multinational corporations. So although we have a sort of semblance of democracy in many countries, including Britain, the rules are laid down by people we don't elect and can't remove. I mean, nobody elected Mandelson, the commissioner of Brussels. You can't remove them. They don't have to listen to us. The IMF, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and, of course, if you look at the military aspects of it, I mean, uh, Britain doesn't control its own armed forces. We don't have atomic bombs in Britain. The Americans lend them to us. And uh, if we, if Blair tried to release the button to fire a nuclear weapon, it wouldn't work unless the Americans switched on the global satellite system. So we all operate now within a structure in the world which is under rules that are absolutely committed to capitalism. I mean, the European Union is the only constitution in the world committed to capitalism. I mean, in America, you could have a socialist government and it wouldn't be unconstitutional. But in Europe, you're not allowed to do things. Anything that interfered with the free movement of capital would be illegal. So, I mean, this is the... As we move towards a, a global world, you have to... A really united world, you have to look and see how you introduce some democratic ingredient there. And I think what the effect of this is quite interesting to watch, is that if governments don't really have a choice, they all huddle together in the middle. I mean, you couldn't put a postcard between Kerry and Bush. What about Schroeder, the social democrat, joins with Merkel, Germany's Mrs. Thatcher. Berlusconi offers us a coalition to the guys just defeated. Blair and Cameron can't put a postcard between them. So we've ended up with a one-party state, a one-party state committed to a system of government that puts all power in the hands of capital. But that's the triumph of Thatcherism, isn't it? And why <coughs> Not it? triumph. I mean, she was a counter-revolutionary. She, real, she and Reagan realised, and this is what's interesting looking back on it, she realised that democracy was the enemy because democracy gives the poor as much power as the rich. You see, I don't, don't think people quite understand what democracy did. It transferred power from the marketplace, because in the old days only the rich could buy homes and education and health, transferred it from the marketplace to the polling station. The poor could vote for health, vote for education, vote for housing, vote for museums and art galleries. And that is the thing that capitalism detests more than anything else, the idea that poor people could use their vote to buy by voting what they can't afford. Because, you see, under capitalism, there are no people, there are only customers. But the poor, uh, the people voted for capitalism. Well, I, I mean, election produced different results, but I'm only saying my analysis of it is that capitalism is very, very hostile to democracy. Because oh. in capitalism, you see, you don't have people, you have customers. Now, the homeless people in London who need homes, homes more than anything, they don't count because they haven't got any money. And so what they've done is to create a world of customers, and therefore if you have no money, you just don't count. And that is something, I mean, it could be presented, after all, the media is very sympathetic to these ideas, and it pumped away at it and produced a result. But for the first time in my life, the public are to the left of what's called a Labour government. Most people in Britain don't want war, don't want privatisation, don't want pensions and a means test, don't want students saddled with debt. So I don't feel alone at all. I just feel that we have a Thatcherite government. And in a sense, Mrs Thatcher answered it. She said, when she was asked her greatest achievement, she said, New Labour. Mrs Thatcher said that. And with New Labour, of course, one of the features of New Labour has been the, uh, Tony Blair's engagement with America in the war in Iraq. Why do you think that has happened? Well, two reasons. I mean, first of all, you see, Britain had an empire and lost it in my lifetime. But now, by piggybacking on American military power, Blair can pretend we've still got an empire again. People talk about Blair and Bush as if Blair was the, was the uh, vice president of the United States. Secondly, as I mentioned, we don't have nuclear weapons, and we pretend we do. And we're able to pretend we do because the Americans lend us the technology. I used to be in charge of nuclear power for years. I know exactly what happened. We couldn't any longer produce our own nuclear weapon. The Americans lent them to us. And in return, the Americans have complete control of our intelligence services. 
So if Blair had taken a stand, as Chirac did, he would have been punished by Washington. And he, took, he took the easy course. How punished? Well, he would have been punished in the sense that uh, Bush could have taken away our nuclear weapons. But that, should, that's already happened, you say? No, 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 not at all. We did have independent bombs years ago, but we are dependent on the United States for the pretense that we have nuclear weapons, and if Bush had been angry with us, he could have very easily taken them away. And so taking I the, think Blair took the, the easy away. course, pardon? Taking the pretense away. Well, he would have made it clear we didn't have them. And I think Blair took the easy course. The easy course in life is to do what you're told by somebody stronger than you are. He told it was a hard choice, tough decision. He didn't. He took the easy choice. He did what he was told. You were opposed to the Gulf War in 1991. This was after <coughs> Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. But didn't the international community have to respond to the invasion and, and, and the, the uh, obliteration of a sovereign independent state? Yes, I think that's a very interesting argument because, of course, as you know, Britain drew the line between Kuwait and Iraq in the 1920s. We drew it because we wanted Kuwait, which had all the oil, to be more under our control. And then in 1958, Selwyn Lloyd, as the British Foreign Secretary, had in mind taking Kuwait himself. And he wrote to Foster Dulles and said Britain might take over Kuwait and turn it into a crown colony. And Foster Dulles said, what a good idea. So there's a little bit of background. But of course I was opposed to the invasion of Kuwait. And when I went to see Saddam Hussein... I went for two purposes, one, to get all the hostages released, which they were, and secondly, to tell him to get out of, uh, of Kuwait. But, you see, he did say to me, he said, uh, I feel absolutely betrayed by the Americans. They armed me, supported me in the war against Iran, and they told me if I went into Kuwait, that Washington would regard it as an Arab question. I have been betrayed. And I said, well, maybe you have, but you, if you don't get out, the Americans will destroy you. And he said, they'll destroy me anyway because I'm too strong. So there are different ways of looking at Kuwait, but of course it was wrong. And what do you think the international community should have done to uh, right that wrong? Well, I've got a question for you. Could you tell me those countries that are in the international community? I mean, I've heard of the United Nations. Well, what do you think but the United what is Nations But what is the international community? Could you describe it to me? Who's in it and who isn't in it? The United States. Um, but uh, that's, so when you say international, you mean the United States, don't you? <laughs> no, I don't. But um, f what do you think should have been done uh, once Saddam invaded Kuwait and incorporated Kuwait into Iraq. Oh, no, no. I, action had to be taken. There's no question about that. I've never doubted that. But I felt that the thing was really uh, uh, seen in a different perspective. I think they went in, in for the same reason as they, um, the recent war. It was the establishment of American dominance in the Middle East. But clearly, I'm a UN man, and the UN says... You are entitled to defend yourself if you're attacked. And Kuwait was entitled to defend itself, which it did in an inadequate way, and to call upon the United Nations. And the United Nations did support that war. They didn't support the uh, present war, but they did support it in 1990. Do you think the United Nations was right to require Saddam Hussein to divest himself or to divest Iraq of nuclear biological and chemical weapons subsequent to the Gulf War? Well, that was a condition of the settlement, and of course he did. You see, I went to see Saddam the second time three years ago, and I said, have you got weapons of mass destruction? He said, no, I didn't know whether to believe him or not. But I saw General al-Saidi, who was his chief uh, military man, who's now been released by the Americans, and he took me through the whole thing. He said, at the time, we were contemplating nuclear weapons, but he described in detail what later came out of the Iraq survey group. Uh, he didn't have any weapons of mass destruction, and we were lied to. The Prime Minister said Saddam might be able to attack us in 45 minutes. It was a complete, absolute lie. And the weapons of mass destruction were used to justify the invasion when they weren't there. All right, but the, Interna but the United Nations Security Council required Iraq to divest uh, itself of nuclear, biological and chemical weapons and to do so in a manner that was verifiable. Now, it's obvious that Iraq did uh, uh, get rid of nuclear, biological and uh, chemical weapons insofar as it had any, but it didn't do so in a manner that was verifiable. And the question is, well, what should the United Nations have done given the refusal of Iraq to, to uh, disarm verifiably? Iraq submitted to the uh, United Nations 11,000 pages of reports. And what happened to them? The Americans took them. They said it contained sensitive material. 
So the Iraqi defence, I'm not defending Saddam, the man was a brute, don't misunderstand me, and I'm not defending Iraq, but I'm saying if you look at it a little bit more carefully, when Iraq submitted what you described quite properly as the evidence of verifiable um, decommissioning, or whatever the word is, disarmament, the Americans took those documents and the UN never saw them. How many times did you meet Saddam? I met him twice. And how long were you in his company? Three hours the first time, and the second time about an hour and a bit. The second time was televised. What was he like? Well, he's a, I mean, he's a brute, and I said this in the House of Commons, and he, he knows that view about that. He's a clever man, he's a lawyer. I thought he was a soldier, but he said he was a lawyer. And I went right through the whole thing with him in the first three hours. On Kuwait, for example, I said to him, look, even the, the best friend Iraq could have cannot accept three different definitions of Kuwait. A year or two ago, it was an ally. Then it was an unfriendly power. Now you tell us it's always been a part of Iraq. And I said, you can't accept, you can't expect any sensible person to accept that. And he listened to all this. And uh, before I went, I went to see <coughs> the king of, of Jordan and uh, Hussein. And he said, say what you really believe to him, because all his advisers, and there were nine of them sitting there, will have never had the courage to say. So I said at the beginning, can I speak my mind? And he said, yes, and I did. And they all sat there including Tariq Aziz and Hamadi and so on and so on. And so I think it was worth doing. Can I ask your impressions of other people? Clement Attlee, how well did you know him? <coughs> well, I met him first in 1937 when I was 12. And, I mean, I, when I first got into Parliament, he was Prime Minister. And he was always very kind to me. He had me to tea at number 10 just after I was elected. And then I, I got to, he came to this house once to a party we gave. I had a lot of time for Clem. And uh, Clem... Uh, uh, had a very interesting background, an officer in the First World War, went to East London, became the mayor of Poplar, and uh, and then uh, wrote a book called The Future of Socialism, which was so radical in the 1930s, and then Prime Minister, and carried through the biggest transformation that ever occurred in Britain, you know, shifting from a... Um, slump-ridden capitalist economy to a welfare state, full employment, trade union rights, extraordinary national health, extraordinary revolution, and, unlike the French who fought in Algeria and Vietnam, got rid of the empire without bloodshed. No, I think Attlee is the greatest prime minister of my lifetime. Hugh Gateskill, who succeeded him as leader of the Labour Party, what was he like? I knew Gateskill very well, and he appointed me to the front bench and so on, and so um, I, I, mean, I disagreed with him. Was he a socialist? Well, he wasn't. He would never have joined uh, the SDP. And the, uh, he tried to get rid of, of the Socialist Commitment Clause 4 and failed. I was on the executive when he tried, and he failed. He couldn't persuade people to do it. But he was uh, committed to redistribution. And during the Suez War, when I worked very closely with him, I mean, he was passionately opposed to the Suez War. It was a breach of the UN Charter. And I worked with him all day on his broadcast and sat with him that night in the studios when he said he would be prepared to serve under any Conservative Prime Minister who was prepared to end the war. Now compare Gatesco on Suez with Blair on Iraq and you have totally different impressions. You see, because of his age, Gatesco brought up in the 1930s and so on, so there was a commitment to things that are not present in new Labour. You're a member of a Labour cabinet that supported the war in Vietnam. Well, I was a member of the cabinet at that time, but remember this... Uh, Harold Wilson wouldn't send any troops to Vietnam. And uh, I remember Harold saying at the cabinet uh, that he'd been to see Lyndon Johnson in Washington and there was a dinner and Harold said, uh, Lyndon Johnson introduced me as our closest dissociate. It's very interesting as you talk about the special relationship. I'll give you three examples. The day I was elected to Parliament, which was November the 30th, 1950, not a day anyone would forget, Truman in Washington, President Truman, threatened to use the atomic bomb in Korea. Attlee flew straight to Washington and stopped it. In 1956, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, Americans, well, I didn't mention but the Americans stopped the Suez War. Eisenhower pulled the plug and so Eden had to go. And in whenever it was at the time of the Vietnam War, Wilson wouldn't send troops. So this idea of the special relationship means you do what you're told in Washington. Not the case, or it means that Washington does what we tell them. I mean, the, the duty of a friend is to be candid. And I think the total 
well, betrayal of the Charter. I feel more strongly about the tearing up of the UN Charter than anything else, because I remember hearing the preamble in 1945, coming home in a troop ship, we, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war which twice in our lifetime has caused untold suffering to mankind. Now, those words are written in my heart, and when Blair tore them up, I felt utterly the destruction of everything that I believed in. So, Gateskill had the same view about the Charter. The Vietnam War is a pretty sordid affair as well, though, and you were a member of a cabinet that supported it. Oh, well, uh, I was, and I mean, you know, when you're in a cabinet, you argue your case. Mind you, in those days, the cabinet was a cabinet. We outvoted the Prime Minister sometimes. Can you imagine today? Can you imagine a vote in the cabinet and Blair losing? I looked up Are in there my... votes in the cabinet? Pardon? Are there votes in no. the cabinet? I looked up in my diary, because I'm a very meticulous diarist, and in January 1968, we had eight full-day meetings of the Cabinet, morning and afternoon. Now the Cabinet meets for half an hour, long enough for Blair to tell the Cabinet what he's decided. We've gone back to a medieval monarchy. What was Harold Wilson like? Well, Harold is a... Uh, I mean, he was an old Liberal when he was a student, and then he went with Anaya and Bevan when Nye resigned in 1951 over the rearmament programme and the cuts in the welfare state. Harold was very imaginative and radical as a young man, but like a lot of people, you get to the top, you do get paranoia. And in the end, he... Well, he was a disappointment. I got very dis disillusioned with him. But um, Harold's uh, white heat of the technological revolution, which people mocked and said he's going to put on a white coat and modernise the economy, it wasn't that at all. What Harold said was, if you don't plan the economy, we'll be burned up with unemployment. He said if socialism had never been invented, the technological revolution would have made it necessary. Harold had a lot going for him, and his greatest legacy was the Open University. Why do you think he resigned? He resigned very abruptly, <coughs> and, and nobody really understood well, the reasons um, for it. I think he had the onset of Alzheimer's, I don't know, but I'm not in the personal gossip side. I think that switches everybody off. No, but I, well, I, I was interested, the reason I asked the question was not, not to do with personal gossip, but to do with speculation that perhaps that there was something involving the intelligence community, MI5 or MI5. Well, there was a programme on the BBC about that, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me at all, because the intelligence community operates entirely a life of their own. I mean, even in this household, my black sacks of rubbish used to be collected every day in a Rover car. Now, I know the local council is very efficient and they're conservative, but I doubt if they would bother to collect my black sacks every day. So I presume they bung your phone and open your letters. I mean, just take that for granted. And I'm sure they tried to down yeah. Harold Wilson. The Callaghan government that succeeded the Wilson government, the Callaghan government was... Uh, went through a very miserable period and then, of course, uh, suffered a humiliating defeat in 19... Seventy nine, yeah. Um, and the Labour Party really has never recovered from that. In fact, the Labour Party, uh, as a socialist party, went out of existence. Well, you see, if you look at the story of the winter of discontent, it goes back to the IMF in 1976. The IMF came to us and said, make massive cuts in your public expenditure. And I opposed that and said it wasn't necessary. The oil is bubbling ashore, which it was. And uh, it wasn't necessary. And Dennis Healy, who carried it through as Chancellor of the Exchequer, whom I knew and, you know, got on with him over many years, he later said it wasn't necessary. The IMF destroyed the Labour government by forcing us to make the cuts. And the cuts were in the public services, and that led to the winter of discontent and opened the way to Thatcher. So I don't interpret it the way it is taken. It was the trade unions that brought us down in 78 9. It was the totally unnecessary cut, rather like what the IMF does to Africa, where, you know, if you want to have your debt lifted, or you've got to make cuts in your public services and sell them off. Why do you think the Labour Party uh, failed to defeat Thatcherism, given the unpopularity of the early Thatcher government? Well, it's an interesting question, and I mean the conventional wisdom of the left and the trade unions that ruined the Labour Party. I don't take that view at all. In 1981, 10% of the Parliamentary Labour Party of MPs left the Labour Party with two of their deputy leaders, Roy Jenkins and, and George Brown, and set up the Social Democratic Party, and with massive media support tried to destroy us. And uh, in the 1983 election, Thatcher just fought the Falklands War, and Michael Foote went along with it. It was a disgrace, really, but he did. And then, during the election, two former Prime Ministers, Callaghan and Wilson, attacked the policy of the 
of the party of which they had once led. So I think it's a little bit more complicated. And then what happened was, and this is how New Labour came about, I think uh, Blair and Mandelson and Gordon Brown and so on, sat down and said, we will never, ever win unless we follow Thatcher's policies. And in 1997, when New Labour won, uh, they won for two, on two contradictory pillars of support. The public wanted to change, but the British establishment didn't want to change. And they thought the safest way of preserving Thatcherism was with Blair and New Labour than under Major, a weak leader and a divided party. So that is how the transformation occurred. <coughs> but I'm not saying it'll go on forever. But it's, uh, I think on the whole, Blairism, if that's what it is, New Labour, is on its way out. But weren't Blair and Mandelson and the others right that the only way that Labour could be re-elected was by incorporating Thatcherism? Well, if you say that, then uh, fair enough. That's a one-party state. No, no, well, no, I'm, asking, no, I'm asking you. Well, I know, but I mean, I'm not in politics to simply to get there at any price. If I wanted to be in power all the time, I'd join the Conservative Party. OK, but m <coughs> my question to you is that wasn't the calculation correct that the way back to office was no, to incorporate no, Thatcherism? No, not at all. I mean, after all, people go into politics for a, a different reason, don't they? I mean, if you just want to be Prime Minister, the safest way to do that in Britain is to join the Conservative Party because they've been in power for longer than anybody else. But people who go into politics because they want to see a better society have to argue their case, put it forward, you may be defeated, and then you go on and you win. And I think that that is the only principled basis on which to go on. I mean, if people want to do it the other way, I mean, if Tony Blair joined the Tory party... Uh, he would have been in office earlier. Indeed, I, I first time I met him, it make you laugh, I, I went to speak for Sheribu in 1983, and I put him in a diary. She was there with her husband, a lad called Tony, that's the first time I met him. And uh, he was supporting the 83 Manifesto, leave the common market, unilateral neutral. He'd say anything to get there. And that was the policy in order to become a candidate, and now it's changed. Talk about chameleons. I mean, uh, one or two chameleons I could name in New Labour. What was your relationship with Blair like? Well, a perfectly courteous relationship, you know. It was, uh, uh, funnily enough, as it make you laugh, uh, when he became leader, I wrote to him. I didn't vote for him. I said, I didn't vote for you, but you're the ninth Labour leader I've known, so I wish you success. And he wrote back and said, I've never forgotten the speech you made in support of Cherie in 1983, which I've always regarded, he said, as the greatest statement of socialism I'd ever heard. So knowing me, I had a tape of it. So I sent him a copy. He said, as you should kindly refer to, I thought you might hear what I said. <laughs> I didn't have a reply. Well, people have to do what they think is right. But he said when he became leader of the Labour Party, new Labour is a new political party. And I'm very glad he said it, because I'm not a member of it. I'm a member of the Labour Party. I'm not old Labour. I'm not having him rename my... I'm a member of the Labour Party. And the Labour Party has never been a socialist party. It's always had socialists in it, just as there are some Christians in the churches. Everybody knows that. And there are some socialists in the Labour Party. And he's tried to break the trade union link, shift to support for big business, and uh, break the link with socialism. And therefore you have to see him in his historical context, Ramsay MacDonald. Are you a Christian? I was brought up as a Christian, but as I get older I see Jesus as a prophet. A man who taught us how to live our lives. I'm not. I'm terrified of people who try to use religion to control us. When Bush said God wanted him to go into... Iraq, I did think that that must have led to a big increase in atheism around the world. Your mother was very religious. She was oh, a yes, theologian. Yeah. She, uh, she, I was uh, brought up on the Bible, and she said something to me I've never forgotten. She said, this, the Bible is a story of the conflict between the kings who had power and the prophets who preach righteousness. And she taught me to support the prophets against the kings. It's got me into a lot of trouble, but it makes an awful lot of sense to me. We'll take another break. Tony Benn, you have published seven volumes of diaries uh, related to your political life. What occasions have given you a great sense of, of achievement in politics over the years? Well, I'm sometimes asked that. Uh, what would you like on your gravestone? And I've said three words. He encouraged us. I think what we need in the world is encouragement. I know, looking back on my life, the people, my teachers and old men in Parliament, when I got there, patted you on the back and said, you haven't got it quite right, but carry on. And I think encouragement is what it's about, trying to understand and encourage and support, because all very well making left-wing speeches is easy to do, but the key question is whose side you're on when the going gets rough. So that's how I want to be judged. Um, I've made a million mistakes, and they're all printed in the diaries, but the one thing I would have been ashamed of if I thought I'd ever said anything I didn't believe in order to get on. 
And I don't think I've done that, but I've made all the mistakes there are, because life is about mistakes and learning from them. But what do you think have been your achievements? Well, I, I hope that I've encouraged people. Literally, I mean, it may sound odd, but I've done a lot of introduced legislation and made speeches and so on. But the, what people need in the world, where pessimism is the official policy of the ruling classes, you know, it's hopeless, you've lost, you won't win, there's no alternative... Um, some of which came out in your earlier questions, that is what the establishment does to you, puts you down all the time. And if you're going to make progress, you've got to give people a bit of a boost. That's why I think another world is possible, which is the phrase of the World Social Forum, is so much more important and there's no alternative. So I've tried to contribute to that. And what have been the disappointments? Well, obviously, if you try to do something and you and you fail, you you think about it, and uh, it was it my fault? Uh, were the others right? Was I wrong? Perhaps I did it wrong. What would we have to do? I mean, that's if you're a campaigner, which I am, you have to think it all that way. But I have no ill will towards the people uh, that I argued with, and uh, I think you just have to accept it. Who became your friends in politics? People who weren't with whose politics you disagreed. Well, I've always tried to be courteous to people, do you see what I mean, and uh, and not make it personal. And although I've had uh, very strong arguments over the years with Ted Heath, we were elected the same year, and over Europe, over his treatment of industry and so on and so on. But I had a respect for Ted because I divide people into signposts and weathercocks and the signpost points the way you should go and the weathercock hasn't got an opinion until he's talked to the focus group and the pollsters and the spin doctor. I have no time for that. So I respect people who I think say what they mean and mean what they say, whatever their opinions are. And Mrs Thatcher, in a funny way, she said what she meant, meant what she said, did what she said she'd do, so you can't complain that people who voted for didn't know exactly what they were doing. But I thought her policies were catastrophic, but that's a matter of my judgment. Did you talk to her much, press? Oh, yes, I spoke to her occasionally, yes. I remember the time, to make you laugh, the time of the referendum in 1975 when she was the leader of the opposition. Uh, I wrote to her and said, will you accept the result of the referendum? Because you know she was passionate in favour of our joining in 1975. Not at all, she said, I won't. Of course I won't accept it. Parliament has to decide these things. So, you know, she shifted her position. Uh, but uh, I see her occasionally and... Uh, I did have one amusing little incident with her a few years ago. It shows you should never tell a joke to Mrs. T. I said, you weren't the first iron lady. She said, what do you mean? So I said, it was Boadicea. I said, the Romans arrived to get us into the Treaty of Rome under Julius Caesar. They killed 7,000 uh, Britons. Uh, and uh, and Boadicea raised it and killed many thousands of Roman soldiers. I said, she was the first Iron Lady, and she nearly hit me with her handbag. I, said, I was the first Iron Lady, but still, uh, that's just a, a funny reflection of uh, her sharpness. But you, uh, she did make an impact, and she influenced people's thinking, and that is what the role of political leadership should be. President Teddy Roosevelt said, the presidency is a bully pulpit. When you get there, people listen. And she used her influence to persuade people of what I thought were ghastly ideas. But she did do that. Did you know Enoch Powell? Oh, very well indeed. First time I met Enoch Powell was 55 years ago. Yes, I did. I mean, he made a ghastly mistake on uh, talking about rivers of blood, but then he was a professor of classics and he was carried away by his uh, um, knowledge. But, uh, no, Enoch said what he meant and meant what he said and uh, and was worth listening to. And the house always filled up when Enoch spoke. I knew him very well indeed. He was hugely influential, hugely influential on immigration, hugely influential on the EU issue, hugely influential on economic policy, uh, and somewhat influential on Northern Ireland. Well, I think you, you interpret Enoch uh, correctly. I mean, Enoch was... Uh, a signpost, and you knew what he meant and what he said. I mean, he did contribute very much to the defeat of the Conservatives in 1974 when he said, don't vote Conservative because only Labour will give you a referendum. And uh, he was an interesting man. I used to talk to him and said, why is it that you love India, which he did. He loved India because he was in the Indian Army, but you don't want any Indians in your constituency. And he used to look funny way. I said, why in favour of the free movement of, of capital but not the free movement of Labour? But uh, the thing about Enoch was that he, he, he did uh, use his political um, power to influence people. And the fact that he was a minister once is of no significance when you look back on his life. He did influence people. I referred earlier to your diaries. Then. Did you have any reservations about publishing 
uh, details of conversations with people that you you would have had several years ago, and they never suspecting that you would publish those conversations subsequently. Well, of course, I gave evidence the other day to a select committee about uh, about uh, official secrets act and memos. I think if you are a member of Parliament, your allegiance lies to your constituents, to your conscience, and to your colleagues, and you have to put that in mind. But the 30-year rule, where you're not meant to say what happens for 30 years... In America, they have the 30-second rule. As soon as it happens, it comes out. And you see, the government, if you put us in that position, the government wants to know everything about us. They want to bug us and open our emails and, and control us, but they don't want us to know anything about what they're doing. And I think that the imbalance of information between government and people is very threatening. So I'm in favour of people um, are writing what happened. But then if you talk about malice, malice is always wrong. Malice isn't a part of diaries. You write, you write down what, what happened. You left Parliament in 2001. And you said you were doing so in order to uh, be more involved in politics. Yes. What did you mean by that? Well, since I left Parliament in, 90, in 2001, I've written three books. I've done about 800 public meetings. I've been to see Saddam and travelled to New York and spoken there. I've done about uh, 12 or 1,300 broadcasts, and I've, I'm a campaigner. But I've had the experience of office, which greatly helps. I'm president of the Stop the War Coalition, president of Labour Action for Peace, of the campaign group of Labour MPs and all that. And I'm very, very active, but I don't have to go to the House of Commons late at night and be told I've got to vote for something I didn't believe in. Not that I ever did, but I, I, I'm a free, and, you know, I'm 81, and when you're 81, the advantage is that you know a lot and don't want anything. It's, uh, that is the one aspect of old age that is beneficial. I go to huge meetings and I say, look, this is a public meeting, but you can relax. I'm not asking you to vote for me. And there's a great sigh of relief and people think, well, if you don't want anything from us, we may as well listen to hear what he has to say. Do you miss Parliament? Um, no, I don't miss the House of Commons. Uh, they allow me, the Speaker gave me freedom of the House so I can go there, use a the library, tea room, sit in the gallery. I've got all the privileges of peerage without the humiliation of being a lord. It's wonderful. Uh, but I, my constituency I miss because I, I learned so much from people who came every week. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people over the years came with their problems and that's where I got my understanding of politics from. You were regarded as a great parliamentarian. You, you uh, were uh, very protective of the sovereignty of Parliament, as you saw it? No, I don't believe in the sovereignty of Parliament, the sovereignty of the people. No, the, par the sovereignty of Parliament is the idea that Parliament can do what it likes. No, it's the uh, sovereignty of the people, but it reflected through Parliament. But I, I, I do believe in, the, in, in free debate and, 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 and all that, and I tried to use the House of Commons intelligently. A phrase of yours I came across uh, was that you wanted to... Uh, that your idea of democracy was one of ma of mass participation rather than wallet uh, uh, wallet control, by which I assume you meant that you felt that people ought to be in charge rather than capital in charge. Um, but how, in a democracy, do you think that people should be in charge other than through Parliament? Well, I mean, a lot of other things. There's cooperative movement. There's the democracy of a... Of a of a trade union, you elect your leaders as a democracy. There's not much democracy in capitalism because shareholders don't really have much say. But uh, no, and there's a whole question of, uh, of the democracy of the media, to what extent. I'm not in favour of state control of the media, but Rupert Murdoch is the most powerful man in the world. He owns newspapers and television in Australia and Britain and America and China. And uh, I think you have to consider the extent to which that influences uh, the way democracy works. So I'm just in favour of, of people seeing democracy as taking responsibility for their own lives, collectively, individually. And, of course, Parliament must be the, the final voice. How do you think the media ought to be controlled to ensure that there isn't dominance, isn't... Uh... Well, I think it would not be unreasonable to say that no man should own more than one newspaper. I mean, isn't that not... That's good capitalist principle, isn't it? It's sort of antitrust act. Why should one man own the Sun, the News of the World, the Times, and British Sky, too. Why should he do that? I know that you're reluctant to talk about personal matters, but uh, one of uh, I said this to you when we arrived at your home here. 
and it was I wanted to see the garden seat that uh, on which you proposed to your wife. Um, how many years ago? Well, 1948, she came as a student, and I met her in, on August the 2nd, and I was very, very shy, and I didn't propose till the 11th of August. Nine days it took me, and she accepted, and I bought the bench from Oxford for 10 quid, and it now stands uh, opposite her grave in Essex, where I have a house. Uh, and she was your partner, as well as being your wife, she was your partner, soulmate. Or well, she was a brilliant woman. She uh, wrote uh, the best uh, biography of Keir Hardy. She campaigned all her life for education. She was on, for 36 years, on the governors of the local comprehensive school, chairman for 12. She was a London, uh, in a London education authority. She wrote so many books on education. She was a very, very remarkable woman, and I put a plaque outside the door. Caroline de Camp, an author, uh, teacher and socialist, and, uh, and I'm very, very proud of her. She had a huge influence on my life. What in particular? Uh, did she influence your politics? Well, she was uh, to the left. Uh, uh, she was an American. She voted for Henry Wallace in 1948, and uh, her politics uh, um, and mine married up. But she was, uh, she was a much greater intellectual than me. She gave me the Communist Manifesto for Christmas one year, <laughs> said, I'm not sure you've read it. <laughs> was she right? I did, yes, it was very funny. Was she right? You hadn't read it then? Well, I knew about it, but she did give me the whole thing. But the thing was that she was absolute. she was American, of French and Irish extraction, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, she brought a whole breath of fresh air into the, into, into the family and into life here, and she was extremely active politically in, in the educational field. That was a great subject. She taught all her life. Um, adult education was a great subject, and I still go to the local edu adult education college where she goes and talks to them every now and again, taught at the Open University. Very, very remarkable woman indeed. Were you close to your father? Yes. Oh, he was a lovely old guy. Born in 1877. Uh, elected to uh, to Parliament in 1906 at the age of 29, I guess, and uh, stayed uh, there. And in the First World War, he joined. Mm -hmm. He, <laughs> make you laugh, he was a pilot in the First War. And I, he um, fought in Italy. And uh, he dropped the first spy behind the Austrian lines ever. And I said, how would you do it, Dad? Well, he said, very simple. He said, I took a saw and I cut a hole in the bottom of the cockpit in front of me, and the spy, Tandora, sat there, and I had a, a, a trap door, and I pulled it, and he fell through with his pigeons, which he sent messages back. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the Second World War, at the age of 63, he rejoined the Air Force. And when my brother was killed, he got himself trained as an air gunner, and he was an air gunner at the age of about 67, before they caught up with him, or 65. And, uh, and he was Secretary for India, and... Uh, Secretary for Air and so on. He's a lovely guy. He was an old radical nonconformist dissenter, and I got, and he and my mum both had a huge influence on me. Um, your brother killed in the war. What were the circumstances? Of well, it was terribly sad. It was a, what's called an operational accident. He took off and discovered his airspeed with bombs to bomb in Germany, and his airspeed indicator wasn't working. Realised he couldn't um, land. Um, uh, uh, because he wouldn't know his speed, so he dropped the bombs in the water and came back and and hit the hit the war sea wall by the airport and broke his neck and died. It was an operational accident. He was a head of DFC, very distinguished. He was uh, 22, but younger than my grandson now, and I think of him every day. He's a lovely guy, really, really nice guy. He was older than you. Yes, he was my older brother. Yes. Um, you yourself participated in the Second World War. Yes, I joined the Air Force, uh, but I was a bit late. I got my wings in 1945, March 45, in Rhodesia. And that's interesting, you see. Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, we lecture them on democracy. When we controlled uh, Zimbabwe, no black was allowed to vote at all. And Cecil Rhodes went there in 1897, the year my mum was born, stole all the land from the Matabele and the Mashona, gave it to the white farmers, prevented any African from having a vote, and now we lecture Mugabe on democracy. See, there's no link between democracy and imperialism. Yeah. But your part in the war... Oh, well, I, 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 I got my wings, went to the Middle East, 
uh, was there at the time of the end of the war, came home in a troop ship because I wanted to join the fleet air arm because the war in Europe was over, did join the fleet arm, then they dropped the bomb and I... So I had no... I was in the Home Guard. I had a bayonet and was trained as a terrorist in 1943. So trained German, as a terrorist? Well, of course, because, I mean, I had my bayonet, I had my grenades, and if the Germans had arrived, I'd have thrown grenades into cafes. I'd have been what they call an insurgent. Well, I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, if your country's invaded, you... So... But they don't use that. But they didn't say we were terrorists, of course. We were heroes. But, of course, if you occupy somebody else's country and they resist, whether it be the IRA or the Al-Qaeda, then they're terrorists. I've known so many terrorists we've locked up at the time of the British Empire and had end up having tea with the Queen as head of Commonwealth countries. Gandhi I met, Nehru I met, Nkrumah I knew, Ben Bella, well, he was a, under the French. They all locked up as terrorists and then they all had tea. What about the circumstances of you meeting with Gandhi? Well, my dad was Secretary of State for India. And so in 1931, um, uh, when Gandhi came to London for the Round Table Conference, my dad took me to see him, and my brother and I, the one who was killed, sat next to him. And when I went to see him, he was sitting on the floor. You know what happens if you're a kid. You'd pat you on the head and talk to your dad. He said, come sit down. So we sat there. I had no idea what he said. But it made a big impact, because Gandhi's commitment to nonviolence is probably the most important thing for the future of humanity. See, my grandchildren, I've got ten of them, have got the greatest choice ever facing any generation. They have the power to destroy the human race, nuclear, chemical, biological weapons, but they're also they're the first generation that have the technology and the money to solve the problems of the human race. And that is the choice. And they are members of the human race. They're not members of the free world, the coalition of the willing, the international community. They're members of the human race. And I think if thinking in that way is the most hopeful way of looking forward to a peaceful world, otherwise, you know, it doesn't follow we won't blow ourselves up to the help you, of you, Bush. You, you had four children yourself. I had four children, yes. And one of them, of course, is in the Cabinet now. <coughs> yes, yes, he's in the Secretary State for International Development. Um, do you have political discussions with him? Well, I take the view that I think any sensible grandfather would take. If your opinion is asked, you give it, but you don't impose your opinion. He's a wonderful guy. He rings me up. He's just been in Mozambique with Mandela. He rang me up and rings me from New York and Darfur and Hong Kong and so on. He's a very sweet guy. And I'm very, I see him, okay, you know, go and have a meal with him. And I saw him over Easter and I shall see him again this week. He's a lovely guy. I'm very, very proud of him. He's his own man and so am I. Uh, do you argue with politics? Well, he's a member of the government, uh, and I know very well what that what that means. You are committed to the policy of the government. I was in the same position under Callaghan and Wilson. But um, he did uh, 25 years of the trade union, local government, deputy leader, and Ealing, chairman of education, and now this wonderful job, and he's not killing anyone. But the government that he's part of is... Well, he knows my view on that, because, I mean, after all, I speak at all the demonstrations. He knows my view and, you know, respect uh, each other's position. That's what you expect. I asked you earlier on if who, who were your friends in politics. And, yes. And uh, I, I think we got diverted a bit from that, but uh, who were your friends in politics? Well, the people I worked with, uh, I mean, obviously, ca cabinet colleagues. And this is the funny thing about the Labour Party. You have great rows with Wilson or Callaghan or Healy or whatever, but it was a family row. Even Roy Jenkins had left the party. The day before he died, I had a letter from him saying, I enjoyed your diaries. I rang him up to thank him and heard he was ill and he died the following day. So you've got your colleagues and then the people who work with most closely. Uh, and now I'm chairman of the campaign group and the left has always been a minority in the Labour Party, but it's a very strong and committed one. I work with them, I work with the peace movement. Would you see Dennis Healy socially now or Roy Hattersley socially? No, I don't. I'm not a great diner. I mean, I, I I lived all my life on a cheese sandwich, a banana, a Mars bar, and tons of tea in my pipe. I mean, I'm not a great socialiser. You said earlier on that you hoped that uh, on your gravestone uh, there would be the words he he encourage. was an encourager. Um, but uh, aside from that, what do you hope you'll be remembered for? Well, I, I think it's a bit arrogant to try and plan your legacy. I mean, Blair is planning his legacy now, and I must say I wish he'd get on with it and let us do it for him. <laughs> I don't think you can do it. You just have to do your best, don't you? There's no more than that. It sounds rather corny, but you just have if there's 
people are being treated unfairly, you support them if they have an opportunity of saying so. I mean, and I do, I go around all the time doing meetings, people who engage in some struggle where they're being badly treated. And I think that they, people need encouragement. All this management rubbish of league tables and, and all that is just such naming and shaming and regulating in 1848, The Economist had a leading article about the slave trade, and they said, you can't abolish the slave trade, said The Economist. As you might have said, you can't have socialism. You can't abolish the slave trade because there's all these ignorant blacks in Africa with nothing whatever to do, and they're needed on the plantations of America. Globalisation, market forces, the thing you were saying. But, said The Economist, you should regulate the slave trade. And I thought of an organisation called Offslave, headed up by Chris Woodhead, who headed our Ofsted, and it would name and shame slave ships where the sanitary arrangements were inadequate. Bah! That's no good. You have to, you have to liberate people, because everyone is a genius, and education should be to unlock the genius, not to cram information into you and then say you've succeeded or failed. I don't believe that. Tony Benn, thank you very much for talking to us.